and welcome to the Actual Tech Media Megacast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information to cover with you. Let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. Now, if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Also, keep in mind that if you have any tech issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's megacast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all of your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentation. And if we do not get to your question during the webinar, don't worry, because the awesome experts that we have here with us today will be following up with you after we wrap. All right, next up on our tour, there are going to be lots of cool aha moments in the megacast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there in your audience console and the hashtag for today's megacast will automatically get added to your post. And our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection of solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. And if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes we will be giving away throughout the megacast today. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. You do need to be in attendance here live at the webinar in order to qualify to win a prize. And we will follow up with all winners after we wrap the megacast today. Now, all winners must submit an IRS form W9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, hey, if you're not sure what those are, no problem. You can find the full T's and C's in that handouts tab. Again, just click into the handouts section, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find the full T's and C's waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember here today is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. In today's megacast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all the questions asked after the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about winning and we will get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the Megacast today and we want to keep that good feeling going. So let's connect on social. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and LinkedIn. We have lots of great content and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content right away after we wrap, you want to jump right in, make sure that you subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and to grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now, you're going to find a link to do that right there in that handouts tab, and you will also be automatically redirected after we wrap today. Now, both you and your coworker, your friend could win a prize, and we actually hold those drawings every month. So be sure you refer somebody awesome before you head out today. It could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab and fill out the application. Then the actual tech crew will match you with some vendors that we think you should be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you can choose to join in, like surveys or test running new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you will learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply or, hey, send that link to a decision maker in your team. Now, I want to take a quick minute here to remind you about one of my favorite resources, and that is ransomware.org. You can find everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, how to prevent and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. So go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books are gonna work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and they are completely free, super easy. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in the handouts tab as well. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get rolling. Thank you, Jess. Hey, so glad to be here today, and welcome everyone to the Actual Tech Media Megacast. Today's topic is the state of IT security. What's important right now? I want to start by saying a big thank you to all the attendees for joining us. We got a huge crowd today, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. Now, on the Megacast, we've got some of the most innovative companies in the industry presenting, and they include Lacework, Vast, and Rubric. As uh, you might have guessed, my name is Keith Ward. I'm that guy on the right there. And uh, I am truly thrilled to be your moderator for this incredible megacast. We're gonna be talking security all day. Uh, lots of great advice and insights for you. So um, if you've got security on the mind, we've got what you need. Now you've already met Jess and you'll also be hearing today from our other fantastic moderator. That would be Scott Becker, that handsome chap right in the middle there. So that's the moderators. Um, in addition to us and in addition to the fantastic content, we also have some great prizes. So let me walk you through what we've got today. Um, really excited to give away Kindle Scribes. We've got three of those. Now the Kindle Scribe is a kind of a combination Kindle and digital journal. Um, kind of a newish sort of thing from Amazon. It's getting some great reviews and I wish I had one of these myself, but three of you will have those today. In addition, we are giving away um, $300 Amazon gift cards every 30 minutes. So uh, yes, yeah, stick around and, you're, and you've got a chance to win one of those fantastic, awesome prizes. I wish uh, at times like this, I was not your moderator, so I could be eligible myself, but what the heck. Um, so <laughs> uh, let's get into the, uh, into the main event here. Now, uh, this is not good. It's time for our keynote presentation. This is not going to be the usual keynote presentation that you might be familiar with if you have been on uh, actual tech media events before. This is going to be a message from some guy named Sai. Now, who is Sai? Well, he doesn't really want you to know that. He also doesn't want you to know exactly what he does uh, or where he lives. Sai is here to talk about why he's unhappy and what you can do about it. Now he's gonna be coming to us from an undisclosed location as well. So let's bring him in right now. Sai, uh, you're up, you can, you know, get started here. Hey, yo, I'm Sai, and I'm frustrated, man. Frustrated because y'all are making it too hard for me to do my job. I gotta earn a living just like you. I mean, I got bills to pay and obligations to meet just like everyone else, but this obsession with cybersecurity is really cutting into my profits. So I'm here to tell you how you can make me happy again. You dig? first thing I want to mention is that I'm, I'm an old-fashioned kind of guy and believe that the old ways of hacking are still the best. That means I still like to get in by using social engineering. Fishing, spear phishing, you know the drill. And in fact, those phishing attempts are getting better now that I'm using ChatGPT to make those emails look more professional. They can fool even the best of you. So I'd really like it if you didn't invest in things like multi-factor authentication. I mean, that really cramps my style. I can sometimes get around it, but boy, does it make it harder. Because of that, I usually avoid those places. I mean, time is money, right? I like the low hanging fruit, which sometimes means 
grabbing this and getting busy dialing. For a real juicy target, I'll call someone inside, pretend to be from HR or payroll, and ask for sensitive information. I love it when y'all don't require your employees to get cybersecurity training. The less they know, the more I like it. Keep them in the dark about the latest social engineering attacks so that they don't see me coming. The next thing you can do to help me out is to get over this whole zero trust idea that's spreading like crazy. I hate it, man. For real, I mean, assuming by default that everyone could be a bad guy until you make them prove by stuff like identity access management that they're safe to be on your network. Making them prove that they are who they say they are and that they don't have access to anything they shouldn't, that totally aggravates me. So I'd appreciate it if you'd open things up more and not be so suspicious. A little trust would go a long way. Privilege escalation is tons of fun. Why would you deny me that fun? Just drop that whole zero trust thing, okay? I'm asking you nice. And speaking of zero, I'm a big fan of zero day exploits. You know them. Those attacks that don't yet have a fix. Those suckers can be nasty. That's why I love it when you don't follow industry best practices for protection and don't have processes like proper reporting in place. Makes my life a lot better. What's even more fun though, is when I get in through an attack that's had a fix available for years but still hasn't been applied because you don't keep up with server patches. Even now, in 2023, it's killer. But there's new stuff that I like too. One of my current faves is supply chain attacks. It warms my heart when you don't properly vet all the suppliers that have access to your network. It opens up so many vulnerabilities. Think about it, yo. Your network might be perfect, but the other guy's apps and data may be compromised. Those holes then get punched into your systems. It's truly beautiful. I get in through one of your vendors and that gives me the opening I need for lateral movement. Oh, when that happens, well, to quote that guy in Aliens, game over, man. So whatever you do, make sure those supply chains aren't closely watched. I mean, you're busy, right? Who's got time to watch like hundreds of suppliers? Now that same idea goes for APIs. Oh, the cloud, man. That thing right there brings a smile to my face. And so many APIs, so little time. Those APIs expose application logic and sensitive data such as personally identifiable information, that whole PII thing. It's a big win for me when I can grab that data stash of yours. Because of that, I'd appreciate it if you didn't do things like keep up with the OWASP top 10 API vulnerabilities so you know what's out there. Ignorance is bliss, like I always say. Now, that covers a lot of my requests for you, but I've saved the best for last. Would you please, please stop worrying so much about ransomware? Come on, people. It's been the best thing to happen to my bank account in forever. It used to be slow and not so profitable, back in the old days. Now, with ransomware as a service, someone else does the hard work of finding the cracks in your network and keeping them open. All I have to do is swoop in with my little exploit kit and voila, in a month or two I'll have rooted around and I'm all set to send you a ransom demand. So then you send me some Bitcoin. Ah. But that's just the first step. I'll also threaten to publicly post sensitive data if you don't pay up again. And you pay. Oh yeah, you pay. 
Then I might hit you again a month later, and the fun starts up all over again. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. I've been living fat off those ransoms, so I really need you to stop doing things like having air-gapped backups and immutable copies of your data. It totally ticks me off, too, when you do things like tabletop exercises that help you quickly respond to ransomware attacks. And don't use those tools like observability and monitoring software that look for signs of entry like excessive login attempts. It just makes my life hard. So, knock it off, will ya? Hackers need Lamborghinis, too. You know what I'm saying? Oh, one last thing, then I gotta get back to my hacking. Don't watch any more of this event. You hear me? Because you'll learn about all the stuff I hate. Stuff that makes my life so very hard. That wouldn't be very nice, would it? So just log off and go watch some TikToks or listen to a podcast about whales or something. That's a much better way to spend the time, don't you think? Yo, peace out, bro. Hmm, who was that masked man? Now, I should say at this point that there are some rumors that that might be someone uh, around here at Actual Tech Media portraying Psy, but I can neither confirm nor deny such rumors. Uh, anyway, um, hopefully you didn't take Psy's advice and you're still here, not watching TikToks or anything like that. And I don't know about you, but I think Psy has got some issues and needs to get out of the house more. What do you think? All right. So anyway, now that Sai is gone, we got a quick poll question for you. We want to know what your time frame is for adding new or existing uh, or updating existing IT at your company. You can see it up there right now, zero to six months, six to 12 months, 12 to 24, and not sure. All right. Uh, Eric, uh, I, I, again, I can neither confirm nor deny that it might have been me doing that. Same to you, Alan. So, uh, again, you're, uh, you're just, uh, you're just making suppositions here. All right. So anyway, enough, uh, enough with about Cy. Um, he is gone to do something else and we are ready to get started with our presentations. What do you say? Another few seconds here to uh, vote in the poll and then we will get going. Okay, here we go. And our first presentation of the day of this mega cast comes from Lacework. The presenters are Tony Karam, the product marketing lead for, La for Lacework. He's going to be moderating a discussion that also, incl also includes Phil Buse, cloud security research manager at IDC, and Andy Schneider, the field CISO at Lacework. Welcome to all of you, and thanks so much for being here today. Tony, I am going to turn this over to you right now. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session, How to Reduce Cloud Identity Risk. My name is Tony Karam, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. Joining me today, we have Phil Buse, Research Manager of Cloud Security at IDC, and Andy Schneider, field CISO at Lacework. Good afternoon, Phil, and good evening, Andy. Thank you both for joining me today. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Tony. We'll kick off our discussion with a brief introduction to security uh, posture management and some of the capabilities and categories that currently exist for assessing and managing cloud security and compliance hygiene. We'll explore why cloud identity risk has become exponentially greater in cloud and why most companies continue to struggle to gain control of it. The meat of our conversation will center around tips and best practices of successful cloud adopters for managing risk. And then we'll peel the curtain back and peek a bit into the future regarding related key trends and technologies. And then we'll close out with some final thoughts that hopefully you can take back and put into practice across your organizations. While none of us wanna relive COVID or the pandemic, it provided a reminder that good personal hygiene 
like washing our hands and not sneezing all over other people are important best practices for keeping us healthy and preventing bad things from happening. Similarly, with building and operating cloud applications, there are a basic set of security and compliance hygiene practices that companies need to implement to dramatically reduce the risk of bad things from happening. These have to do with gaining visibility of what cloud resources are in use, and then assessing whether they pose any inherent risk to the business. The good news is there are a growing number of tools available for checking security and compliance posture. Vulnerability management is certainly not a new concept, but one that is made more difficult when talking about continuously scanning containers and images for known vulnerabilities. Tools like cloud security posture management help provide an inventory of cloud assets and ensure the proper configuration and use of those services. And there are a number of open source and third-party infrastructure as code scanning capabilities, so teams can assess the posture of their infrastructure as code within development long before code gets into production. Kubernetes security posture management is very similar to cloud security posture management just for your Kubernetes environments. And data security posture management aligns with data discovery, things like data classification, and knowing where sensitive data lives and its relative risk. Guys, I'd love to get your thoughts on the topic of cloud security posture. Phil, let's start with you. Uh, thanks, Tony. And it, it's great to be with you. And it's such a great topic. And those are great points. And for me, it all starts with digital transformation. So digital transformation has driven the move to the cloud for the past several years, which resulted in an initial lift and shift approach, as I think we're all aware, uh, with suboptimal application performance and security gaps kind of left in its wake, right? So now we're in this digital business era where revenue is generated by digital products, services, and experiences. There is a focus on clear and measurable business outcomes. So partly as a result of digital transformation, we now have the complexity of multi-cloud, right? We have the complexity of hybrid cloud, and we have the complexity of cloud-native applications that dramatically increases the attack surface, which needs protection. I like to think about it this way. It's about visibility, it's about insights, and it's about action. To have the visibility into an organization's cloud assets, how many, where are they? And this visibility must extend into identities and entitlements as identity is the new security perimeter. IDC research has shown that compromised credentials through phishing is the leading cause for breaches. Next, insights, insights into cloud asset relationships, and of course, ephemeral workloads and serverless functions that are often added without the knowledge of security teams. And then actions, which normally require multiple lines of business being involved, sometimes leading to organizational friction. Now, you may also be wondering about cloud security overspend, a hot topic for sure. And while security spending is the least affected among IT spending, according to IDC research, and is increasing for most organizations, there is a 24-hour news cycle reminding us of high-profile breaches and supply chain attacks. So when organizations are asked to describe their stance on security in the public cloud compared to security that can be delivered on-premise, the majority believe that public cloud is more secure, and that's for good reason. All of the benefits we're familiar with by now, including infrastructure cost savings, faster application deployment, scalability, and access to 24-7 trained and certified security practitioners. But then organizations began questioning their own security posture readiness, and this gets back to the security posture comments that you made at the beginning. It's been a long-held belief that the less mature organizations or digital laggards whose compliance standards may slow the adoption of new technologies were more at risk and susceptible to attacks. So we put this to the test. In IDC's December 2022 U.S. Cloud Security Survey across major industry verticals, 
which focused on mature organizations, and let me stress that again, mature, 30% of respondents rated their organization's security posture as planning phase or low. An additional 28% cited only moderate protection. So that's a combined total of 58% describing their posture as moderate or less than moderate. For me, it's concerning that that uh, your research shows that uh, most of the mature organizations still are in an immature security state. If if we look at cloud security, um, I know I think I know why it's the case. So if you think about large organizations that move to the cloud, many pr proceed with a lift and shift approach. So they try to go with lift and shift to the cloud. And if you think about a security team, if you just want to, from a digital business, so the digital transformation, you just want to modernize your, your business and your digital product that you have, maybe a web shop or an e-commerce application, a banking application, whatever. Uh, moving to the cloud means that from a security perspective, you have uh, no longer one infrastructure to protect, but you have two infrastructures to protect. And in the business case of that digital transformation, usually no one says, oh, we need a double the amount of security people for that. Because it's maybe we have a good security team, but they are good network security engineers. And maybe we don't need the network security engineers in the cloud anymore. So I, I think no one is doing that calculation in their business case. So with that lifted shift, what is happening that many security teams and CISOs out there they have to deal with that cloud thing suddenly. But in their mindset, they are still in a perimeter. They have network protection, so a very network-centric security approach. And also from how you do security, it's very hierarchical. You have a CISO, you have a security team, you have to ask for permission. If you then enter the DevOps world, well, asking for permission is not the normal thing that you do they do, and they do it very quickly. And suddenly in the cloud, things are data and identity driven. So the, the, the network disappears completely. So if you then have a security team that tries to lift and shift their security mindset, so you have to have a firewall and you put a cloud firewall in front and the problem is solved, well, that's not the case. So reality looks differently. So I think that's where the CISOs and security teams realize, okay, we have to start over. and they start from, let's, let's get some visibility, what we have, then we move over and we, we do a configuration and we do things right from the beginning on, either on the left side or on runtime, so the posture management, and then they move and move very slowly to the right. Um, personally, I think that's, uh, it's, it's an approach that I understand also from budget perspective, but it's the wrong way how to do that. So if you have a child uh, and that is your digital crown jewel um, and you have a wooden house that might be your cloud infrastructure, uh, you can clean it up as often as you want. You might want to put a sensor in it, a fire sensor, in case uh, there is a fire in there. So many start on the left and then slowly move to the right. Uh, and there's that hype around shift left and shift left is good, but you, you framed it right with shield right is very important so you can also start with shield right and then you you're you're secu not secure but you know if something happens if a fire breaks out i see that i can react to that and i have enough time to really clean up the mess that has been created and i think that is not happening organizations really jump to the left and very slowly move to the right and in that time, and this can take like two years or three years in a large organization, they would even do not detect any attack. And this is for me concerning. And the second thing is, if you then come in with your network mindset, many don't understand that it's all about data and identity. And we talk a lot about identity today. It's identities. You have to find these toxic combinations and other things. So identities are the key to be successful in the cloud. I think we all agree, everybody agrees that, you know, cloud hardening your cloud security and compliance posture is, is critical, right? Um, part and parcel of that, it's 
how are you configuring identities, whether those are human identities or machine identities um, across your cloud? Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, what challenges organizations are faced with in, in, in managing and trying to control identity risk specifically. Um, you know, I heard you both talk about the fact that I think, you know, identities become the new security perimeter in cloud, right? Because all the traditional sort of perimeter defenses have been sort of stripped away in cloud. They, they don't exist anymore. Um, but, you know, managing identities and access has always been a challenge, even on-prem. And, you know, it's just become exponentially more difficult in cloud. And, you know, a couple of reasons we hear or I hear for that is, you know, the sheer number of permissions. So trying to understand who can access what, when, why, and how, right? In, in cloud, you know, just with the three large um, uh, hyperscale providers out there, I heard the statistic, there's probably somewhere like north of 40,000 permissions, right? That they offer. The, the other challenge organizations seem to be faced with is the fact that, you know, a lot of research will show most organizations, especially large organizations, have a multi-cloud strategy. Well, the fact that the large cloud service providers all speak their own identity and access management language, they all have their own taxonomies, really creates an issue, right, for organizations on, you know, how do they how do they track identities across these platforms, right? It becomes really difficult for them to do that. Um, I think the other thing is uh, we're, we're, we've heard is the fact that um, you know, identity, the what sort of how we define digital identities has completely changed in cloud. Earlier, uh, for on-prem services and applications, mostly we were concerned about human beings, right? Human identities and what they had access to. But a simple cloud deployment can introduce thousands of non-human or machine identities that are constantly changing, right? Unlike us as human beings, we don't change all that much. The profile of those machine identities and service identities can be constantly changing. They may only live for seconds or minutes, right, at a time. And then finally, I think, you know, um, just the nature of cloud development in DevOps and the automation and the autonomy that uh, developers are given these days from a self-service perspective uh, really puts security folks on their heels a bit um, because trying to understand what permissions developers may or may not need, and then likely developers in the like trying to understand, you know, how to assign permissions or entitlements to resources or services in the cloud can be really challenging on the front side. So, you know, typically I hear a lot about organizations just overly privileging, right, or creating over permissions for users. And they all have good intentions, right? They all say, hey, look, we'll just give everybody everything and then we'll kind of scale back from there. The reality though, I think is what we hear is that scale back never really happens. People don't go back and, and don't do that job. So uh, certainly would love to get your sort of feet on the street perspective, Andy, uh, on kind of what you're hearing folks are really challenged with if what I said sort of resonates or if there are other things you're hearing about. Yeah, absolutely. So there are like these two types of, uh, you could say, customers. You have startups that raise money. Uh, they build an MVP to show the investors this is like the new product. And everyone knows that you should, uh, if you have a successful working MVP, you should throw it away and rebuild it correctly. And this means not running it with highest privileges uh, and uh, this is never happening because then if they if they raise money, uh, they have to rush forward. Then they have to go to market and other problems. So they are overprivileged. The same happens for the ones moving to the cloud because uh, uh, no one said, okay, now you you got this thing running. You can, you have all the time in the world to rebuild it and make it correct. So this is just not happening. Now the real concern with uh, with development teams is. They are willing to remove privileges, but they fear that it breaks the application. And no one wants to break the application. 
So you have a lot of, from a security perspective, you have like, you have no chance because uh, if you say we will do a project that is uh, actually not providing any revenue directly, but we will slow down that. And most probably our digital product will break and we will lose revenue. No one would do that. So everyone hates the topic. It has been the same in the past. These were humans, but now it's really like, it's like your whole product won't work anymore. So the, the real struggle is finding out which privileges can I remove and nothing will happen. I want to, They want to have the proof. And this did not exist in the past. So that's, that's I think, the, the real challenge on the one hand. And the other thing is, if you build everything from scratch in the cloud, it will look beautiful in the beginning. And you just have to wait for a couple of years and it will look messy like on-prem, um, just to, to say it like that. So it's... It's many are are not aware that if you don't do it right, right now, it really become uh, uh, an enormous problem later. Uh, that's a lot to unpack, uh, really. And you know, you gave some great examples. I think of the overprivilege by default and lacking visibility in accounts and yeah. and not being able to determine the identity risk and the right sizing of the permissions. Um, so first, I think organizations need to unpack the nature of those entitlements. And the fact that the number of entitlements is really overwhelming many security teams uh, brings to light the division of tracking those entitlements between humans or the users and machines, uh, you know, consisting of serverless IoT devices and the like. Uh, you know, uh, Tony touched on this earlier. Uh, IDC research on this topic does confirm that among organizations which have a current KIM solution, two-thirds are tracking non-human entitlements. And considering the highly ephemeral nature of non-human workloads, as Tony mentioned earlier, which can last for minutes or seconds, uh, you know, commonly referred to as invisible, uh, makes this percentage likely higher. So, these challenges are compounded by multi-cloud, the correlation of entitlement data with other security findings and regulatory compliance reporting. So entitlements which are not managed and tracked properly can lead to those overly excessive permissions, creating visibility gaps and opening the door to the cyber criminal, the malicious insider threat, or the unintended employee negligence, which I think uh, organizations are just having a really tough time with. So there is also this growing talent shortage, adding fuel to the fire, which I think we're all very familiar with. Uh, IDC research shows that in response to the growing talent shortage, organizations are using non-security staff. Think of IT admins to handle security. You know, just think about that for a second. Once we start dealing with challenges of IM, identity access management, and cloud infrastructure entitlements management, or KIM, which are really hard to begin with, you can go off the rails pretty quickly. So we're seeing KIM as becoming a foundational component to those platforms going forward. So love to pick your brain. Uh, both of you, Phil, let's start with you. Like. Uh, on what you're seeing relative to best practices and core capabilities for this new emerging set of capabilities around Kim. So when I think of um, uh, a modern Kim roadmap, there are five signposts uh, which should be considered. Uh, you have to evaluate the net effective permissions. So those permissions that are programmatically given directly through a resource or resource-based permissions through a group or assume transient roles that give permissions, that there must be full visibility at a granular level of cloud identities, resources, and related permissions. Uh, second would be to enforce least privileged access, as you mentioned, or, or LPA. And that goal of LPA is to assign the user only the necessary privileges and access to resources to complete a task, no more, no less. Uh, LPA helps to further limit attack surfaces, which I think is really key, uh, by reducing the total number of exploitable vulnerabilities with the establishment of those least privileged controls. Uh, what was once a dreaded manual task is now becoming automated 
So in concert with LPA, Kim delivers improved security, capacity planning, uh, audit compliance, and the ability to maintain control over licensing conditions. Uh, third, you need to manage and track those excessive permissions. And this is something that I'm gonna keep coming back to. Organizations must be able to view used versus unused permissions. For example, a standard industry use case may be the mining of all log data. You need to review all used, unused permissions, assess the observability of usage, and right-size the permissions accordingly. This can have a tremendous impact not only on the compliance with security and privacy regulatory requirements, but also in your go-to-market strategy by not blocking that crucial access for developers. And as developers gain confidence that their workflow will not be interrupted by security mandates, the trust and confidence will grow, reducing that security developer team friction that we talked about earlier. And it opens the door to shifting security left and shielding right. So we have protection throughout the entire software development lifecycle. And fourth, you need to prioritize proactively. I think in order to cut through the noise of false alerts and focus on the most severe threats, modern Kim solutions must map identities to an attack path based on severity. The worst projects in my life as a CISO were identity projects where we did a cleanup. The cleanup meant you had to you had a list like a sheet of hundreds of accounts that had maybe high privileges, and you had to go to the people and say, we want to remove that. So these projects took like sometimes years, but they were highly effective. But it took years, you had to fight all the time, and you only created enemies. So you couldn't have lunch with them anymore for a couple of months until they calmed down that you removed their admin privileges or whatever. So this has been the past. But these were just a few hundreds of accounts or thousands of accounts. If you now look at the cloud, it's tens of thousands of accounts because everything is an identity. So this becomes even more uh, difficult. And I remember in, in my last company, the typical incidents were like, oh, there has been a, a, a leaked API key somewhere. So now what? What is the impact of that? So if you think about what you described, the attack path, what is the impact of that uh, uh, API key? Who, who had access to that? And what happens with the uh, API key afterwards? W which data are affected? Which business units are affected? So having that immediate visibility is very important in that, in that fast-paced world that we live in. So if, it, if an incident happens, you want to understand as a security team what do I need to do now, right now? What is impacted by that? What is the right playbook that I can apply here? So this is, it's part of Kiem to, to give you that answer. So a good Kiem solution for me is not like a standalone solution, but uh, gives the information, the context to other disciplines that we have, like um, attack path is also used for vulnerability management uh, to show where where's that and what might be affected by that. So you can enrich that there, but you can also um, en enrich additional information. So if you, if you know how an identity behaves, this is really helpful because you find out, well, uh, even if the vendor says your third party, you need, uh, let's say 100 uh, privileges granted to that, maybe you never use them. And it wouldn't be the first time that we would have third-party breaches uh, from vendors that the root cause was just overprivileges that were in there. So you can reduce that. So a good key solution by itself uh, identifies and analyzes what is being used versus what is being granted. But the magic is if you then and enrich the other parts, because it's so complex, like I explained, so the security teams are mostly overwhelmed with cloud security because it's an on-top discipline for them that they have to take care of. Um, I think it's important for them that they know where to focus on. Is it now catching these, these 30 hosts or is it uh, reducing the privileges from these uh, uh, identities uh, without the danger of breaking anything? So 
uh, helping teams uh, to focus on the right thing, what to do next, I think is the, the most important part. In the past, I never knew, is it now, is it now reducing the privileges? Is it now the important part to do that? Or is it patching? Or is it something else? Is it awareness training? You just did what you had to do, but the tools today in, in the cloud, they can help you. They, they can analyze everything and can show you identities are not good, but maybe you have everything messed up so dramatically, maybe first start with step ABC. So, and the senior platforms, they shall provide that, but they are not only effective if they really share their context in between. So if we look, for example, at um, compromised uh, identity uh, or compromised credentials, you want to understand the full impact of that and the full picture. And that is not just limited to the identity. It's also what's happening around that. Where there are some misconfigurations. How does the attack path uh, look like? What might be impacted? Are other alerts generated, for example, from from agents that do workload protection, that something is also happening on a host to get, get that full picture. That's for me the key to do that, um, to really help security teams uh, running the best remediation or the best playbook at that time. Uh, otherwise, people spend a lot of time with analyzing what might have happened. So I've seen very often these alerts coming in, and then you call a secu external security company that is running a forensic investigation. And then after maybe one week, you know what to do. And that's too late. You have to do things much quicker today. Um, but if I would now start in the cloud, for me, it's really looking, and that's what I see with, with customers also, they really start with the most risky accounts, for example, or identities that are in their environment. So they can really say, these are really the most riskiest ones. There might be toxic combinations, even if you think this is an this is not a, a an admin user. With all the roles that are attached to that, it might have um, admin privileges or the highest privileges in in the organization. So finding these and giving back the focus is the key, and that's what I see with customers. If they start with with Kim, that's what they like. They see in in one view. Um, where to start and what they have to focus on right now. That's where the, the tools really can help, especially if you combine it with the surrounding disciplines like CSPM, KSPM. It, it really helps you to focus. And like I said in the beginning, and Phil also said that shield right is very important. So adding that detection capabilities is key because every or almost any attack in the cloud will uh, have identities in there. So having that shield right approach um, on top of that uh, KM and CSPM, I think is the best way to be successful. I want to thank both Phil and Andy again for taking the time to share their amazing insights and experiences related to cloud security. If you would like to learn more about how Lacework can help you understand your cloud identity architecture and reduce cloud identity risk, please visit us online at lacework.com. Okay. Thanks everyone for that advice on reducing identity risk. Um, I just texted with Sai and he gives that presentation a big thumbs down. He doesn't want you to know any of that stuff. Okay, and time for our uh, next poll question then. It's right up there now. Let us know what additional resources you'd like to see from Lacework. Now, uh, we had a lot of great questions come in uh, for this uh, presentation that we didn't get a chance to get to, but it's important to let you know the Lacework team will do their best to respond to all questions that came in after the event. So if you ask one, have no fear, they will get back to you. I'd also like to remind all of you about the handouts. We've got a link from Lacework for more information about their solution. Be sure to check that out if you'd like more detail. And thanks to everyone who's responding to the poll. We do appreciate this feedback. It's very important to us and to our presenters. I'll leave it up there for one more moment, and then we will uh, do our first 
prize drawing of the day. So, um, as I mentioned at the top, we have got a $300 Amazon gift card to give away and our first Kindle scribe of the day. So the winner of the $300 Amazon gift card is David Fizen from Wisconsin. And the winner of the grand prize that Kindle scribe is Hubert Phil Jr. from Alabama. Congratulations to you, David and Hubert. We will be in touch about claiming your prizes. And with that, why don't we get to our next presentation? Uh, this comes from VAST, and the presenters are Jeff Herbert, the Director of Strategic Alliances for Data Protection, and Stuart Abbott, the Director of International Data Protection. I'm going to be hopping on at the end for some quick Q&A with them. So uh, welcome to you, Jeff and Stuart. Jeff, I believe you're on deck, so please take it away. Thank you so much for having us. Really appreciate the time. And wanted to share a little bit of our perspective on things. And what's really interesting about this, as we think about vast data, if you guys are familiar with us, we are an AI infrastructure platform, right? So if you go to our website, all you will see on our website, right on the landing pages are all about AI. All of our announcements recently have been around the AI space. So why are we here talking about data protection, backup and recovery and ransomware? Well, the reality is when we built a highly scalable, all flash platform that includes data deduplication, we ended up solving a lot of the problems that customers are dealing with with legacy data protection solutions. So specifically, We'll talk about this and I'll let Stuart dig into a little bit of the architecture. I'll give you some of the ideas around here, but the ability to actually recover data has changed focus in terms of operations around data protection. Historically, other vendors, legacy vendors have focused on the backup window, the backup time and the backup speed in their solutions. The problem with that is when we talk about ransomware, it's all about recovering data and how fast you recover the data. So as we started thinking about where VAST lives in this space and how our AI platform can be applied, we started looking at some of the vendors out there and you can see those in the, in the slide here. We have partnerships with all of the major software vendors, but the reality is what we actually have built is a solution that makes those solutions work much more efficiently, much faster. And our unique architecture gives you as a customer flexibility you wouldn't have otherwise had with a typical you know, controller-based array system with spinning disk and deduplicated data on those, right? Anyone who's used those systems, whether it's a tapes environment or a purpose-built backup uh, appliance, know that recovering data from those environments is a true challenge that doesn't meet today's requirements. So there's a little bit of time talking about how our new architecture, our approach to this is we'll solve those problems and a little bit more detail about some of the flexibility around that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stuart who joined me here today. Appreciate your time, Stuart. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so what have Vast um, built? Uh, we got, I'll take you back to 2016 when the company was formed and it was formed at that time because three new technologies started to come to market um, in a more generally available way. And those things were storage class memory, hyperscale flash, and uh, NVMe fabric. And what that's enabled us to do is create um, our DAIS architecture, which stands for disaggregated shared everything. And that is fundamentally different to any other storage platform on the market. What the NVMe fabric allows us to do is to separate our compute nodes, so the stateless containers you can see at the top. We have four stateless containers per compute node and the storage that you see at the bottom. Um, now, historically, storage and compute has had to scale together because of the latency that's created in the network. So with the invention of non-volatile memory express fabric, we are able to disaggregate those two things, which does a couple of things. Firstly, it enables us to create a, uh, a commercial model for all flash that makes it comparable and, um, uh, and even in many cases better than spinning disk. So the way it does, the way we're able to do that is by having hyperscale flash in our storage nodes 
we put a thin layer of storage class memory above that so that as the data writes down to the hyperscale flash, it lands on the storage class memory and we then stripe that across hyperscale flash. That process enables us to elongate the life of hyperscale flash to a point where we, are, we will put a 10 year warranty on that hardware. We then have the stateless containers sat within our C nodes and each of those stateless containers are connected to every one of the storage disks within the pools. That means there's no east-west traffic across, uh, across containers. Uh, every container sees every storage pool. That means you could lose every container and you still wouldn't lose service. So it builds in a level of resilience, but really what that does is it enables us to create a really super fast um, uh, storage platform but uh, we are able to scale our compute and our storage separately. All of that is built under one global namespace. Now that is super important because then it allows us to deduplicate data across a single global namespace that scales out to exabyte scale. Um, and we also have a technology that is patented from VAST, which is called Similarity. That enables us to dedupe down to byte size level and look at uh, look at similar files. So in typical deduplication, um, you would need to have exact matches. With VAST, the files only need to look similar, and then we can deduplicate those two. So what we've therefore created is a model with hyperscale cheap flash, and then we're able to deduplicate across that to make sure we land way less data on our on our storage than other vendors. Um, thanks, Jeff. If we can go to the next one. Yeah, I just want to add a quick comment there. I think one of the interesting things about what we've built and we, how Vast functions as a company is if you go to purchase our solution, we have the same solution for data protection as we do for AI, for high performance computing, for data lakes. All of the structure that we've built, it's a single model, unlike traditional legacy vendors, which might have, a, you know, 100 different models to choose from. Ours is designed to scale to whatever workload or requirement our customers have. And so one of the things that happens we'll have a little bit about us coming up upcoming slides here is that we can scale asymmetrically. Uh, and with that, I'll let Stuart go into this. So I didn't mean to steal your thunder there, Stuart. Yeah, no, look, Jeff, no, no problem. Um, I, I appreciate, I appreciate you always. Um, so look, why did we create that architecture? There has to be an outcome, and the outcome is is quite simple. It's it's creating a uh, a single platform for all of your data needs, um, but but because it's all flash, and we're creating the rapid recovery that we need, we have to find a way to take an all flash solution down to a cost point that is cheaper than tiered storage. Let's not forget, uh, tiered storage has been around for a couple of decades now, and the reason it has a place is because of cost. If people could put all of their data on one tier, um, and that tier could be as performant as, as all flash, then, then they would certainly have done it through the years. So what Vast Data have been able to do is create that platform, and you can see here, we've, we can deliver an all flash platform with a TCO that is lower than a normal tiered solution. And then the outcomes of that, we will restore data. Uh, so we will read data 50 times faster than the next fastest performing PBBA on the market. So if you can think the next fastest purpose-built backup appliance on the market, vast data restores data 50 times faster and at hundreds of times greater scale. So we, as we, as we grow, we grow under that single namespace each generation, as we as we go through new generations, we can add those generations to our pool um, and continue with that. There are no data silos. Um, and as a result of our deduplication technologies, and I mentioned similarity earlier, we're also able to make sure we deliver this with 66% on average, less rack space across the data center and creating 60% less power consumption. So when you add the full TCO together of a vast solution, and don't forget, we can run our TCOs now out over 10 years because we will guarantee our hardware for 10 years. And then when, and then as you license those uh, arrays, you license them based on post deduplication data landed. 
add all of that together um, and you get to a cost point that is very attractive in a solution where you will never need to migrate data again. That's a pretty important point too, because we're scale out, you never need to migrate data again. Forget, forget your four or five year um, array cycles when, uh, when you need to go refresh, we won't be doing any of that. Don't know if you've got anything to add there, Jeff? Uh, no, I think you've, you've nailed it, right? And um, as a long time data protection specialist, right? I know that our customers are very familiar with the maintenance bill they receive in year five <laughs> that says, hey, it's a lot cheaper to migrate than it is to, uh, I'm sorry, to, to purchase the new one that it's continue supporting this, right? But I think what you really hit on there is the idea around the TCO. Clearly, everyone I talk to says, hey, flash for backup doesn't make sense. It's just too expensive. So what Vast Data has done is built in all of these functions that actually can bring the, the total cost of ownership for the solution to a point that actually makes sense. The reality though, is we know that if you were just talking about traditional backup models where customers might think tape is okay for what I'm trying to do, and I don't really need to worry about recovery times, then flash probably wouldn't make a lot of sense for customers. But that 50x recovery performance there, right? That's really the key here for our customers who are struggling with ransomware, right? So in the ransomware world, you know, five years ago, you would say, okay, if I get hit. Well, three years ago, you say, well, when I get hit, what's going to happen? Now you look at it and say, okay, what, I'm going to get hit. How am I going to respond, right? So the questions have changed over time and the ability to get that data back much faster is key to our story and what our customers are looking for in space, right? Completely agree that, you know, a smaller footprint, dense solutions make a ton of sense, but it all comes down to how can you take the architecture that we provide and actually allow customers or enable performance to actually change things, right? So left-hand side of this slide, historic way we viewed recovering data in the backup world. Okay. I worried about my backup speed. I worried about my backup window. And then if I had to recover data, I wasn't so concerned about it. It was really best effort around that, which by the way, tape and spinning disk do a pretty good job at best effort recovery times. <laughs> but the reality is trying to recover data in a sequential format from spinning disk that's been deduplicated with data across it is really painful. And the longer you keep that data in play, the worse your restore time is going to be. So I will almost guarantee you, you will never find a spinning disk purpose-built backup appliance vendor who will quote restore times. Because they know that as the data ages and they have to retain more of that, it gets slower and slower and slower, which is actually part of the reason they force the migrations because they know, hey, the best way for me to, to make performance better is to either remove data or to rewrite the data in a new, new appliance. The problem is that whatever solution you have today, you might have built it to solve for the left-hand slide beside of the slide, but the reality is the right-hand slide is what we care about now. It's being able to recover as much data as possible to return, return to normal operations as quickly as possible, right? I don't wanna say it directly, but the reality is ransomware has suddenly made backup sexy. <laughs> Right? It didn't actually used to matter as much to customers. Sure, I had to do backups, we know that. But the reality is now we talk about doing restores, that's what customers are starting to care about. right? And using Flash and our disaggregated shared everything architecture suddenly makes it much more realistic to start thinking about ways you can get data back in a parallel format to actually get your operations up and running. But it's even more important to start thinking about, okay, what else can I do with this box, right? So Stuart did a great job of walking us through the architecture. So you see our, kind of the C boxes on the top, our D box, which is our just a bunch of flash at the bottom here. But now you can start thinking about different ways to approach the solution. So I can take some of those C nodes, right? So the actual servers inside of my C box, which actually I can virtualize even further and start allocating them for resource uh, pools based on what I want to do. So in the first one here, I've got my data protection pool. This is my standard backup and uh, recovery operations pool. You see on the left-hand slide side of this, I can do client direct backups directly to VAST as well. Now, part of the reason for that is we are an NFS, SMB, S3, multi-protocol platform. 
So you could do NFS dumps from databases directly to VAST. You could do S3 client direct backups using your backup software. Multi-protocol works fine in our environment. We can write from one, read from another. You could write with NFS, read with S3. You can write with S3, read from NFS. We don't care because fundamentally they're objects that are stored in our element store. But what it really means from a backup perspective is I have a lot of flexibility for how I can actually go and design and build my solution. So now maybe I wanna say, hey, got it. I can do my standard operations on one side, one set of pools here. I wanna go and build a dedicated restore team, uh, pool. Great, I allocate my C box or my, my C nodes in the box to actually just do functions of reading data. That is how we can actually go and say, okay, I can optimize for recovery performance based on that. Now, maybe you have to have a data mover, whether it's a, you know, a Commvault media agent, a Veeam proxy server, a Veritas media server, any of those functions to actually move the data. Maybe you have to allocate some of those architecture within your application to do that. But the reality is I can, within the VAST system, say, hey, here's these systems are just going to be used for restore so that I have full access to the data. But what gets really cool, and this is why I think from an AI platform perspective, we've really started to change the game, is we didn't set out to be a backup product, right? And in fact, when I joined the company here, I talked to one of the founders. I said, hey, look, I don't want to join a storage company, go sell backup stuff. And he's great. He said, he's like, great. I don't want to sell backup solutions. That's not what we're here for. We are here to solve multiple customer problems across the board. So this same platform that can run AI workloads, high performing compute plus clusters can also be an NFS data store. And what that actually means is on the same box where I'm doing backups, I can actually run my VMs. So that in the event of an attack, I can actually eliminate the recovery window completely. I could replicate VMDKs to another location on VAST called my instant recovery pool and be able to actually spin those up in the event of an attack. Now I'm just turning them on. I'm not actually running restores. And you probably wouldn't want to do this for your entire environment, but clearly you'll have critical workloads that you, know, you can measure downtime and dollars to your business. So if I can bring those things back online immediately, I've changed the game for recovery purposes, right? Last part here, I have another C-Box here. I can actually do a whole bunch of other things with this. I could say, hey, I want to put one of these C-Boxes in a completely isolated network. I want to put it in my clean room. I want to put a copy of my data mover and database there as well. I can start running scans against all of my backup data, right? So all, all of our partners now have threat scan type of functionality, be able to scan the backup data, look for corrupted files, to look for um, infections in the environment. But I also can test restores here. I can test uh, moving data around, uh, it, all kinds of functionality exist here. But in the event of a true disaster and my data center is unavailable, I still have access via my clean room environment to all of the data living on the VAST platform. Because again, as, as Stuart pointed out, all of our C nodes, all the containers can see all of the data living on the VAST cluster. So the reality is I have full access to that environment in the event of an attack. Right? So these are some of the flexible architectural things that we believe we bring to the table. But so last part of it on a security aspect of this thing, right? I mentioned we are NFS, we are SMB, but we are also S3. And when we talk about protecting data in the backup world, S3 object lock is almost a requirement for any solution you wanna look at. Because what ends up happening is in an attack, right? Now, again, attacks have changed over time as well. So you could think about um, any level of different infiltration, right? But typically what will happen is the attacker will try and go after your backup product and delete the backup data before they run an encryption protocol, before they run their wiperware, before they actually go after and attack your data, they will try and eliminate your ability to recover it. So object lock gives, uh, prevents them from actually making any changes to the backup data once it's hit the hit the, uh, the vast cluster here. So they can't delete it, they can't encrypt it, they can't do anything to that data because we've used S3 object lock to write the data to vast into our S3 buckets. All the retention times are managed in conjunction with your backup application, so it's all coordinated. But the reality is we've secured the data in a way that allows the customers to protect that information um, and use it in, against those type of attacks. And again, so kind of this approach, this holistic approach of thinking about how you can secure your environment and recover at speed 
and fundamentally even eliminate recovery windows by using the same platform to do different aspects is really key. One thing I didn't mention though, is our ability to deduplicate data. So Stuart did talk about our similarity functionality, which is another level of deduplication capabilities. So if I look at this kind of architecture I've laid out here, I can do my backups and I will store that data. Now, again, if you're using say Commvault or Veeam or even NetBackup, which you're doing deduplicated backups, we will get additional deduplication on top of that. Like we recommend you let your applications run their deduplication functionality. We will get additional on top of that. But then what it allows us to do is actually start thinking about other ways to do this. So those VMDKs that I have living in my instant recovery pool, they could actually be almost free because I've already seen all the data that's been stored in them and I'm storing it on my cluster. So I could actually copy those VMDKs and let them live effectively storage free in the vast world. Right, so there's all kinds of functionality that really, when you start thinking about what a data protection solution is designed to do, we've unlocked things that you couldn't possibly have done two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, right? It didn't exist. So the idea to be able to take the same solution and think about it in multiple ways is why we think we really have built the ideal platform for helping protect you guys against ransomware. Stuart, anything you want to add to that? No, Jeff, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I'll turn it back over to you then. Okay, well, I'll just take it over to wrap up, just um, a bit of a recap on the things we've already learned. So um, vast data is built for customers that, uh, that have ransomware uh, front of mind. So um, we're really looking to help customers that, that understand and believe that one day there will be a ransomware attack and that that ransomware attack will be successful. Um, and, and what is their remediation at that point? So we're asking people to rethink recovery. If you look at um, many purpose-built backup appliances on the market, they're probably restoring at something like eight terabytes an hour. Well, Vast will be significantly over 400 terabytes an hour. So 50 times faster than legacy purpose-built backup appliances. In a ransomware situation, that speed of recovery is all important. Also remember that your backup appliance is now all flash. So if your primary environment is not clean, it's still, um, it's still locked down, where do you recover to? It's another question that, that, um, that customers need to answer. Well, with Vast Data, you can just run your primary system straight off your backup. It's fast enough, performant enough to do that. So in the event that there is nowhere immediately to recover data to, just run your environment from the backup until such time that you can recover. And then rethink scalability. We are a scale out system to infinite scale. That means uh, uh, it, it means there are no silos created as you as you scale um, through our system. There are you, we're not we're not siloing systems. You buy one system, buy another system, buy another system, and all that data is siloed for deduplication purposes. Vast is scale out to exabyte scale, creating one global namespace for deduplication and simplicity of management. Rethink resiliency. So that exabyte scale also comes with a six nines plus uh, availability. The system, the system just works. The architecture is different and the system works. And then security. As data lands on the platform, it's immediately immutable. Um, and then when you add to that indestructible snapshots and another and a number of other techniques that we use along with our ISV partners, um, the security, the security across vast data platform is truly enterprise class and then total cost of ownership. The first the first, second and third hurdle we come across when talking to customers about vast data for data protection is I cannot afford all flash for my backup environment. Because of some of the things we've mentioned today, which includes our, uh, our patented um, deduplication technologies that enable us to dedupe data down to uh, a byte size level and at similar file types, add that to the hyperscale flash, which is, uh, which is an inexpensive flash solution. We lay storage class memory across the top of that to protect its longevity. Um, what you get is uh, up to a 10-year total cost of ownership model where you do not migrate in that period. 
You do not migrate from one system to another in that mic in, in that period. As we go through generations of um, of different technologies, you just add generation two, generation three, and generation four, and you keep scaling. So um, essentially, we're saying affordable all flash with rocket style restore capabilities in a very simplified, manageable solution. Um, guys, thank you for listening today. We really appreciate uh, everybody's time. Uh, I'm going to hand over to the adjudicator, see if there's any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks so much for your time and presentation. I uh, love the idea of making backup sexy again. Uh, about <laughs> time, you know, I would say for that. Um, so first of all, you've whet a lot of appetites, I think, with this presentation today. Um, for someone who wants to learn more about VAST and kind of take that next step, what do you recommend? Uh, well, following uh, this webcast, uh, everybody that registered will be receiving a questionnaire. We would love it if you could look out for that, um, answer the questionnaire, and then uh, any data or any or any uh, anything that any people we can get to meet you following that questionnaire, we will set up those meetings. All right. Anything you want to add on to that, Jeff? No, I think that covers it. Uh, really appreciate the time, really appreciate everyone's attention here, and look forward to helping people here solve the ransomware problem. All right. Well, Jeff and Stuart, it has been a pleasure to have you on today to be learning more about VAST and what you're doing. Always great innovation coming from the company. And thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, that was a terrific presentation from Vast. I do have to say that I checked with Sai, and he disagrees, though. He totally thinks you should ignore their advice and just assume your backups are safe. There's no need to check on them at all, is what he's telling me. All right, and with that, it's time for the next poll question. Let us know what additional resources you'd like to see from Vast Data. Um, we had a bunch of questions for VAST that uh, we're not going to be able to get to any more of them right now, but VAST will respond to all the questions. So if you ask some that don't that didn't get uh, answered, don't worry about that. They will be following up with you. Um, as we uh, keep the poll question up for another minute, I want to remind all of you about our handouts as well. We have a link from VAST to a case study showing the benefits of its backup and recovery solution. So be sure to check that out. Thanks to all of you who are responding to the poll. We appreciate that feedback and uh, give you another few seconds here while we get to our next gift giveaway, which is going to happen right about now. All right. We have another $300 Amazon gift card to give away. And the winner of that is Peter Sachs from Massachusetts. And the winner of our next grand prize, that Kindle Scribe, which looks so juicy, uh, is Christopher O'Shaughnessy from Pennsylvania. Congratulations to both of our winners for this latest uh, half hour. We will be in touch about claiming your prizes. So sit tight and you'll be hearing from us. And with that, folks, we are on to our final presentation of the Megacast today. Let me introduce our speaker. He is Joshua Stenhouse, the field CTO for Cyber Resilience from Rubric. Now, at the end of his presentation, our very own Scott Becker will be joining him for some Q&A as well. So you get to hear from all of the mods today. Uh, and uh, Joshua, he is ready to go. Thank you for being here today, sir. And you have the floor, so take it away. All right, let's go. So hopefully I'm going to share some inf interesting information with you all that is going to give you one really solid reason why you need to start looking at moving those timelines closer in, in the tooling in your environment. So my core focus is going to be around cyber resilience and recovery from ransomware, but also, you know, periphery benefits of modernizing your approach to backup. And, and if you think about backup, 
you know, traditionally not a very sexy topic at all. But if it, now, if we look in the context of, okay, well, if I'm going to supercharge backup, why would I do that? Well, the answer is that every single organization in the world today has this fundamental question of, can we recover from a cyber attack? And specifically within a reasonable time frame where the business is going to be happy, the board, and we can also stand a chance of getting away with it not being in the national news. And, and a good you know, RTO objective is 24 hours. If you're down for more than 24 hours, that's not a blip. If you're back online within 24 hours, then you can get away with it. And so you have to ask yourself when you're looking at your tooling today, is that if you can't confidently answer yes to this, then you need to look at the tooling that you have in place. And when you start looking at that tooling, what I want you to realize is that everybody has multiple layers of defense. Everybody has firewalls and endpoint protection as a minimum, maybe even intrusion detection. And what you have to presume is that between zero day vulnerabilities, humans and unpatched systems, I mean, even if you have VPNs with MFA, that an attacker can get in. And if they do, and all of your lines of defense fail, then as a business, you're going to go to your backup and disaster recovery solutions and say, hey, we need to recover from attack. Now, if those solutions are not designed for this use case, which likely they're not today, unless you're already using rubric, then the unfortunate consequence is one, they won't survive the attack. And even if the, you can make them survive the attack, they're not gonna have the ability and the visibility to tell you what point in time to recover from and reduce that downtime and impact. And so this is where rubric comes in as a way of supercharging IT is that we replace traditional backup and disaster recovery technologies with a solution that is purpose built for cyber resilience. Yes, it checks the box day to day on backup and recovering all your workloads and data irrespective of where they live. But the core reason why switch and why bring that change of your tooling forward is because you, if you can't answer yes to this question, then you need rubric because we'll change it to a yes and give you the ability to prove it. But we can't do that if you don't have the data backed up. So supercharge number one of what we do for our customers is we consolidate multiple tools and interfaces into a centralized SaaS based control plane. So the workloads that we address today for backing up and recovering are your traditional on-premises, virtual machines, physical databases, et cetera. We also help customers protect large and structured data sources. And when I say large, I mean typically half a petabyte or above where you, you typically can't back it up with traditional tools. Also, you might have increasing amounts of sensitive and critical data in 0365. Microsoft doesn't back it up. You have to. And then furthermore, you're also going to have workloads in the cloud, either lift and shift or born in the cloud or plans to do so. So the first supercharge that we give our customers is a platform that we call the Rubrik Security Cloud that is a SaaS-based control plane that gives you a single pane of glass. But most importantly, you are still controlling the data locality. So in your data center, we'll still put in physical appliances so you have a local immutable backup and a local and the fastest recovery. But as soon as you start talking about anything multi-petabyte NAS or already in the cloud, then all the security cloud is gonna do is stream that through to object storage and lock it off. But this gives you centralized control and it doesn't matter whether it's a VM in a data center, an O365 mailbox or an EC2 instance, everything is 100% immutable and survivable and you get global policy management. So a typical rubric customer as a massive supercharge is going to see a 90% admin overhead reduction. So you're not just saying, hey, we're modernizing backup. You're actually reducing the time you spend managing it by 90% because you apply a policy in the central console and it pushes to everywhere you're protecting and the bigger the environment, the more benefit that's going to have. But the interesting thing is that if you go back a few years, everybody said and was concerned about the data in the cloud. And predominantly other than leaky buckets, it's actually quite easy to protect data and make it immutable in cloud. But the biggest gap is the data in the data center. And what I have to tell you is that if you're looking and evaluating your tools today, and you're looking at, hey, if an attacker gets in our data center, how are we going to be able to then recover from that? I have some news for you. And the news is that if you're looking for a file-based encryption attack, 
you are looking in the wrong place. If you think an attacker is just gonna encrypt your files, then all of your tools that you're building and products and services are going to now miss what is the most common attack because it's actually now, and in the last six months, this is what we've seen via our ransomware response team, only 40% of attacks encrypt at the file level. So you think about, you've got the best endpoint protection in the world or the best that you could afford. Well, that's running in a guest, in an operating system. That's looking for a file-based attack. That is now not the most common. What is the most common? It's actually a hypervisor-based attack. They go to the hypervisor and encrypt at the VM level. Why? Because the attacker knows that you're not running your endpoint protection in the hypervisor. Your tools aren't geared for this. And furthermore, it's also extremely fast to then encrypt an entire environment because they'll just encrypt the virtual machines and that then by proxy encrypts all of the files within them. So this is a huge bomb. You need to be thinking about this in terms of your tools and your services inside your data center that everything is gonna be bypassed. And then furthermore, everything running inside a virtual machine, you have to now presume is gonna be taken out in an attack. So supercharge number two is you've got to put in some kind of data vault to ensure that you have a survivable bunker in a box, a, a survivable copy of your data that you can recover. Now at Rubrik, we do this by putting in dedicated physical appliances that are converging both the operating system, the backup, the dedupe storage. So it's all local to the, the data vault and all of the security controls of a vault in a single solution. And you can't just put an appliance for storage because if you do, okay, you can make the storage survivable, but you've got no visibility, no scanning, no ability to recover. So it's got to be the whole infrastructure of backup recovery and backup storage soup to nuts completely converged. And it has to be physically isolated. You've got to make sure that your ability to backup recover and store the data is survivable from a hypervisor based attack. Therefore, nothing should be running in that hypervisor. If it's running in the hypervisor, it's gonna get taken out. You've also got to make sure that you're not running Windows anywhere in your recovery stack. In 100% of attacks I've been a part of, Windows is taken out every single time. So if it's VM-based or Windows-based, it's gone, it's not survivable. You've also got to make sure that whatever you're putting in supports all your major hardware vendors and it scales out so that you can have a data vault that's a couple of terabytes all the way to a larger data vault with multiple physical servers as a single cluster that scales to petabytes. This is of course exactly what Rubrik does with the Rubrik data vault. We also make sure it's encrypted end to end by default, so in flight and at rest. And you've also got to make sure that the data is air gapped. And when I say air gap, I simply mean that the backup storage, the operating system and the shell are not accessible in the network. Yes, it's physically connected for the fastest recovery speed, but no, you cannot access the underlying operating system or data. And furthermore, even if you could, it's all natively immutable. So this to rubric has been since day one, since inception. And all this means is that one, you can't access the underlying backup data. It's all encrypted remote procedure calls. There's no NFS or SMB. And furthermore, it's all 100% immutable. Cannot be edited or encrypted. We have our own proprietary file system that's append only. But that doesn't mean an attacker is not gonna try and expire backups. So we also protect the interface with mandatory MFA local users so you're not reliant on a directory service, retention lock, so even an authenticated backup admin that gets through MFA still can't prematurely expire the backups. And then furthermore, NTP protection so they can't even drop the clock or change it to 2050 and have the backups expire anyway. The data vault uses a monotonic clock, it knows enough seconds have not passed for it to be 2050, won't expire the backups any differently. And next, you've got to make sure that all of your intelligence, your ability to scan inside the backups to determine what to recover and what is a clean recovery point is built into your data vault. And that if that's a separate service, if it's running in a virtual machine, it's gone, it's not survivable, you're going to have no intelligence, no clue. So it's got to be built in and leverage all of the compute that you're putting in for your backup and recovery to give you the fastest recovery time and the fastest and lowest recovery point objective. And what I can tell you is that it's only when you put all of these security controls together with a rubric data vault and a data center that this is the best shot you're going to give yourself of making a major attack a recoverable event within hours versus days or weeks if you're not modernizing and supercharging your backup in your data center with a rubric data vault. 
But the next thing to be aware of is that that's just getting a secure copy of the data. So supercharge number three is, well, then how do I get the intelligence of knowing what to recover from what point in time in that data? So we're not at rubric just putting in a data vault. We're also layering encryption detection. Now, a lot of backup vendors will say, hey, I'm doing anomaly detection, maybe even doing file level encryption detection, either in the backups or in the guest. The problem there, you're chasing ghosts. That's not the majority of attacks. So rubric will do file-based encryption detection. If any file is encrypted on the next backup, we'll pick it up. But for the most common attack, a VM level encryption attack, rubric is both surviving that attack and the only solution in the world today that is able to detect that VM level encryption detect, alert you, and we can plug this into your SIM and your SOAR to alert your security teams and give you the point click go ability to drive the recovery. This is not just anomalies. This is not just looking for file based encryption. This is looking for the most common attack of VM level encryption. But the next problem is the attacker says, I have your data and I'm going to release it. So the, the, how are you going to ascertain what was stolen? And the unfortunate truth is that it doesn't matter what tools or services you put in your environment. I can tell you in an attack, nothing can tell you what was stolen. Why? Because an attacker has an encrypted tunnel. They have a back door. They can siphon anything off. And the only thing you could really use to verify what they have is trust that if they give you a full download of it, that is everything they've got. So this clearly is, is not a good situation. So as part of supercharge number three, what rubric does is we build in sensitive data discovery into your backups. Now this is built into this immutable backup platform. So first of all, this means that you've been attacked, everything's down, but you still have an immutable interface to log in to say, okay, we can still see what sensitive data was in that network because everything that was on that network and especially everything that was encrypted is now the minimum that you have to presume as exfiltrated. So rubric can tell you what was in that data by just scanning the backups. We have 60 different analyzers for all the common data types, so it knows what to look for, for a credit card, PII, et cetera. But you can also put your own regex and pattern analyzers on top. But the biggest value in terms of supercharging your IT that you're gonna get from number three here is using this proactively. Because it's fair to say it's too late after the fact, Yes, it's still useful, but it's way more useful if you can mitigate and minimize the amount of data stolen in the first place. So the biggest value in supercharging our customers get is using this day to day to minimize the sensitive data on the network. Because okay, the first scan of a billion files is gonna take time, it'll probably take a week. But the next scan, because it's built into backup, knows well only 3% has changed here, I only have to scan the 3%. The next problem that you're gonna have is let's say the data was encrypted last night. Does that mean that now we can immediately recover to yesterday? Absolutely not. Because how do you know that you're not going to be reintroducing the attacker into that environment via the malware and remote access tools? So as part of supercharge number three, we also layer in built-in threat hunting. And what we're saying here is that built into this rubric data vault, we will scan through the backups in their offline state. And this is unique because everyone else will say, hey, I can scan, but what they're doing is a mount. And as soon as you mount and you scan every file, then you're talking days to weeks to try and find a recovery point, a la you're just not going to bother. With Rubrik, we don't mount the VM or the server to scan it. We scan it offline with our own proprietary scanner that scans thousands of backups in seconds. So we can tell you very quickly, via our intelligence or feed in your own. So you bring in security incident response, feed in a YAR rule, list of hashes, will tell you this is a clean recovery point per server and then quarantine the known bad. And that is absolutely game changing and one supercharging IT that you probably didn't even think that you needed or were looking for, but I can guarantee is going to be the biggest difference in reducing the recovery time in event of a ransomware attack because you can find a recovery point without having to bring a server online. And just think about, you know, how long it takes to recover your servers, load a tool, scan, and then rinse and repeat versus just scan back in time and within minutes know my clean recovery point. Absolute game changer and why you need to be supercharging IT with Rubrik and bringing that decision forward. But then the last piece of the puzzle is then understanding that, okay, let's say, 
we found a clean recovery point. How do we now automate that? So we build in built in cyber recovery workflows to automate that recovery, drive the fastest recovery time. Also auto select the last clean backup. So it, it goes to the most recent backup that doesn't contain the malware or the encrypted data. And most importantly, give you the ability to test and prove in advance your recovery time and prove that yes. Can we recover if you have these supercharged capabilities? Yes, you can recover and yes, you can prove it. And you have the associated documentation and reporting to show that. But then the next problem is, okay, let's say I've got all of these tools. Well, now I need people to actually drive it in response to an attack. So supercharge number four <clears throat> is rubric just doesn't give you these tools and say, good luck. We actually then give you a team to help you drive it. So if your backup platform is the last line of defense of your business and your backup vendor does not have a ransomware response team, then you need to reevaluate your position because you're going to have to use those backups to recover in the event of an attack. And you're going to need help doing that, considering that the majority of your team have probably never been through an attack and know how it even goes down. <clears throat> and what I can tell you is there's your life before an attack and there's your life after. Learning curve is off the charts. So Rubrik has a dedicated team for this function. This is the team that I work with in learning what the attackers are doing and then make sure we're building that into our products and services. This team have done over 150 major recoveries today, 97% of which never hit the news because they got them back online so fast and they stay with you until they are no longer needed. And this for me is a significant value in itself in just being able to call this team. But don't get me wrong that this is not a replacement for having any incident response team on a retainer. This is actually a, acting as a bridge between your in-house backup team, your security team, and then any team that you have on incident response. Because all three of these are now going to need to work together and leverage all of these tools and capabilities. And if they're not working together and leveraging the tools that Rubrik is bringing to bear, all I can tell you is that you've invested in a tool and yet you're not going to see the benefit because they're going to go to traditional recovery methods of saying, hey, let's just recover the servers, load a tool and scan. So the part of this team is helping you get the biggest value from the tools that you're putting in place. Because that's a challenge everybody has when you're looking at your IT stack and tools is, hey, I can buy it and implement it, but is anybody going to use it or am I wasting my time? So this is your answer to that problem is that even if you implement it and nobody looked at it again since, this team are going to help you get up to speed very quickly in leveraging it. And this supercharged capability is not a chargeable extra. It is built into part of being a rubric customer. Interactive support and maintenance, you get this. But everything I've spoken about so far <clears throat> is just standardizing and modernizing your backup on rubric and then giving you all the capabilities to respond to an attack. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if you could put in a new tool that also allowed you to move up the kill chain and move from being reactive to proactive? And that's my final supercharge, is that once you put in rubric, we don't just sit there waiting for the bad day to happen. We actually continually monitor your data. So we're doing a continuous proactive threat hunt of your all of your data as it's backed up and continuously then being updated on each new backup. And we have a dedicated in-house team that are building a daily curated and updated threat intelligence feed. It scans the last seven days of your backups, <clears throat> scanning thousands of backups in seconds because we can index all of the hashes on the files. And anytime we find an alert, we're going to send this to your SIM and your SOC for alerting. And we have pre-built apps for the majority of the SIMs out there, but you can push it to anything via webhook. You can also bring your own intelligence feeds, but our focus from our intelligence is on the rats, the remote access tools, the credential stealers, less on the malware. We will look for it, but that's still the end of the kill chain. But the core premise here is that you're standardizing on rubric to move from being reactive to proactive. And with that, don't back up, go forward. Back to you, Scott. All right, excellent. Um, I, I really like those uh, those five supercharges. That was uh, that was nice. Um, and Josh, we've we've had a, a bunch of questions come in. Um, 
Let's see. Rob is wondering, is the ransomware response team unlimited in nature or is it pay by incident? It's unlimited in nature. It's not pay by incident. Just by being a rubric customer for backup, you get access to this team. Okay, super. Uh, Mark has a question. Can a bunker in a box handle live updates via mobile devices? Um, not quite sure where that question's going via mobile devices. Um, but in theory, yes, I guess, because the bunker in a box is connected to your rubric security cloud. And from the rubric security cloud, you can push updates to all your bunkers. So if you logged into your mobile device to do that, then yes. But a bit of a strange question, that for me. <laughs> okay. All right. And Mark, maybe you can follow up with a, a little more uh, detail about what you're looking for there. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question here is, if I have endpoint protection, why do I need rubric? Mm. And for the very simple reason that, hey, endpoint protection is great at stopping an attacker, but if it fails or has been bypassed, which will happen now in the majority of attacks that encrypt at the VM level bypassing it, then you need a last line of defense that isn't both immutable, survivable, and able to drive the quickest recovery. So it's not an either or, it's both, but just know that it's going to be bypassed in the majority of attacks. Okay. Uh, this next question I love. I love uh, uh, tabletop exercise questions. They're wondering, what's the most common mistake you see in recovery from ransomware tabletop exercises? So two big mistakes. Number one is presuming that all these services and tools are going to be available. So straight away in your tabletop exercise, if anything is running in a virtual machine, you should not be allowed to access as part of the exercise. That is immediately going to blow the doors open wide on any recovery exercise. And then the next big mistake is just presuming that you can recover to yesterday. So one, many of your tools are not going to be available. And two, you definitely can't just recover to yesterday because you're just going to reintroduce the attacker. And when you figure out how long it takes you to make that determination, those two are going to give you the biggest bang for your buck in realizing just how bad this situation is going to be and making your tabletop exercise realistic. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, Joshua, um, we're about up on time, but I, I did want to ask if people want to learn more about Rubrik, um, how, how, what's the best way for them to go about it? Super easy. <clears throat> Just go to rubric.com and like uh, most websites these days, a little chat bot will pop up and you can also click the contact me and learn more. All right. Well, Joshua Stenhouse, thank you so much for coming on and, and bringing us up to speed on, on Rubrik and giving us those, uh, those five ways to supercharge your, uh, your backup. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. And thanks all. Okay, great presentation, Joshua. And thanks for handling that Q&A, Scott. Lots of interest um, on Rubrik's presentation today. Now, I did check back with Sai again, and he said that he thinks all of this stuff about virtual machines, hypervisors, windows, backups, all of that stuff is so overblown and that everyone is just way too worried about it. He said to tell you what you have right now is perfectly fine and there's no need to even check up on it. And with that, um, you can see we've got our final poll question up. Let us know what additional resources you'd like to see from Rubric. Uh, operators are standing by, as they say. And for all the questions we couldn't get to um, that came in from uh, for Rubric, know that Rubric, the Rubric team will respond to your questions. So uh, don't worry about that. Also, I'd like to remind everyone about the handouts one more time. We do have a PDF from Rubrik, and it's called The Definitive Guide to Zero Trust Data Security. Be sure to check that out for uh, more detail. Uh, zero Trust, of course, is one of the hottest uh, concepts out there today. Uh, thanks to everyone who's responding to the poll. We do appreciate your feedback. I'm going to leave it up here for one more second or two or three. Um, and uh, with that, actually, I tell you what, we'll just leave it up here for another 10 seconds or so. So keep voting on what you'd like to see from Rubik, what kind of feedback you'd like, what you'd like to hear from them next. And I am going to then move on. We are ready now for our final prize drawing of the event. Yay! Uh, one more chance to win that $300 Amazon gift card and one more Kindle Scribe. 
Uh, as Jess mentioned at the beginning, you do have to be present for the entire event to be eligible for these prizes. And the winner of the $300 Amazon gift card is Moises Padilla from California. And the winner of the final grand prize, that Kindle scribe, is Tyson Willard from North Carolina. We have our final two winners. Congratulations to Moises and Tyson. We'll be in touch about getting you those prizes. Okay, um, not sure where that came from. That is not supposed to be there. So let's move on. That was from earlier. All right, this is where we're supposed to be. Uh, and uh, this is about the question that we ask here sometimes where you were watching the event today uh, and thinking that this type of thing might be the place for you to talk about your platform or solution uh, similar to what you saw today. I can't promise you that Cy will be joining you. You may not even want him around. But um, if you think that one of these might be a good event for you, a good fit for you, we also have custom solutions. And so if you think we can do something uh, for you, please email us ASAP at connectedactualtechmedia.com. We're ramping up for 2024 already and would love to hear from you and set up a schedule for you. We've got more security coverage coming up here. Um, we've got a mega cast, and this is coming up tomorrow. Uh, it's about, it's, well, it's starting. Let me give you the details. It's starting uh, tomorrow, November 16th at noon Eastern, which is 9 a.m. Pacific time. This one is about how to integrate security earlier into your processes and make your environment safer. If that sounds intriguing, make sure you sign up for that right after this event wraps, which is going to be happening momentarily. So, um, Folks, I hope you enjoyed this today, and we are just about wrapped now. I want to thank all of our presenters for putting together such great presentations and Q&A insights. I want to thank uh, all of our participants for making this event possible. That would be Lacework and Vast Data and Rubric. And I'd also like to say to that hacker guy, Cy, hey, Cy, I don't know if you noticed, you clown, but folks stayed on to the very end today. Ha, how about that? And thanks to all of you attendees for hanging around and making Cy grumpy and increasingly unhappy. He may not appreciate it, but we sure do. All right, folks, uh, that concludes today's event. I enjoy being on with you so much. I want you to have a great rest of your day and uh, stay safe out there, everyone. We'll see you in the next event now.